I'm here to tell you, ladies and gentlemen, not a month goes by where I don't get a call at my institute by someone telling me that someone in the government implanted these things in their brain without them knowing. I'm not kidding. Now you may say, this doesn't concern me, or my children, or my community, but this is less and less true. The world is on a crash course with trying to turn humans into gods. Unprecedented developments of human cognitive abilities, refine artificial intelligences, and brain-computer interfaces simulate complex systems, create humanoid robots and cyborgs, and with the help of nanorobots, we may develop manageable matter. Find ways to transfer one's personality to an artificial carrier. This is an article from 10 years ago. The VOD is developing a parallel to planet Earth with billions of individual nodes to reflect every man, woman and child this side of the dividing line between reality and AR. Your brain reality is your reality. And if in fact I can import information into that brain and take outputs from that brain and link that to an avatar so that brain thinks that it's body moving in the world and experiencing the world, can we do this? Yeah, we can do these kind of things. At the time of initial reports on the program, there were only 62 country-level simulations being run by the U.S. Department of Defense. These simulations grouped humans into composites, with 100 individuals acting as a single node. But already at that time, the U.S. Army had used the systems to create a one-to-one -one level simulation of potential Army recruits. It's the stuff of a Hollywood... So you just watched someone literally of veterans has filed a lawsuit against the CIA and U.S. Army claiming that the government planted remote control devices in their brains. The claims relate to a government program at the U.S. Army's Edgewood Arsenal in Maryland. The avatars and the nodes, when those are manipulated digitally in the simulation, it manifests physically in the human brain and the physical body. It is like pulling strings. It is like a puppet on a string. We are seeing an alarming rate of complaints of use of electromagnetic weapons for the use of cognitive control or behavior control. And although it may not be that the sky is falling yet, folks, it looks like rain. Bring an umbrella. That said, what's going to rain down? This. Android robots to replace people in manufacturing tasks. Android robot servants for every home. Thought-controlled avatars to provide telepresence in any place in the world. There is a very real risk that you are going to become a full-blown, 24-7 targeted individual. So what happened? These are quantum computers and supercomputers such as the D-Wave system. And so once you have connected the targeted individual with the frequency um, and they resonate together, then you have a perfect uh, avenue upon which to send and receive information back and forth. And that's exactly how they manipulate someone's thoughts. They send voices into someone's head. Uh, they manipulate their emotions. They manipulate their behavior. And then that's also how they receive back from the individual in real time uh, the vital signs, the emotions, the thoughts, uh, what the person's seeing, what the person's hearing. And then all that information, of course, is rendered on a computer elsewhere the um, via can software be. and it can be monitored and tracked in real time so you know for a fact that these weapons that you worked on they're being used domestically today absolutely uh, it seems to be more weapons research than medical research um, i've personally corresponded with upwards of 1500 victims all complaining of identical complaints from every state in the nation they're being accused of being crazy they're being accused of being paranoid and schizophrenic to completely cover up what is in fact a social engineering program and a covert research and development program for some of the most sophisticated and advanced KKK technology that the world has ever seen. This whole conspiracy to enslave humanity is a psychological game. You're not going to sell a tyranny by telling people it's a tyranny. Today no war has been declared. And however fierce the struggle may be, it may never be declared in the traditional fashion. Our way of life is under attack. While I was in the service, I found out that there is an ongoing, non-consensual human experiment, and it's testing a human-machine interface weapon. And it 
these irrational Satanist insurrectionists are engaged in a Confederate insurrection against the United States. They're using these positions to systematically use uh, secrets in order to cover for their terrorist attacks, substantively changing the United States through their fraudulent policies and customs without reason in order to enforce their coup by voter fraud and other stems of insurrection. And this has to be understood as a continuation of long-standing policies in order to create the one world revelation Satan government. The so-called black budget has never been shown to the public until now. Since 1996, the Pentagon has spent $8.5 trillion in taxpayer money that has never been accounted for. Every year, hundreds of billions of Pentagon dollars go missing, not because of fraud, waste, or abuse, but because U.S. military planners have appropriated it to secretly develop advanced weapons and fund clandestine operations. A shadowy government with its own Air Force, its own Navy, his own fundraising mechanism and the ability to pursue his own ideas of the national interest free from all checks and balances and free from the law itself. Senator Daniel Inouye is speaking about the unacknowledged special access programs or USAPs, an entity that uses taxpayer dollars but is not beholden to domestic laws. Unacknowledged special access programs are not to be confused with special access programs that are acknowledged. Edward Snowden, for instance, disclosed, among other things, a program called PRISM. But PRISM was acknowledged, meaning the president, Congress, and key members of the intelligence community knew of its existence. USAPs, on the other hand are small top secret compartments whose very existence is not known by anyone outside the compartment a department of defense manual describes usap as follows quote unacknowledged saps require a significantly greater degree of protection than acknowledged saps a sap with protective controls that ensures the existence of the program is not acknowledged affirmed or made known to any person not authorized for such information all aspects technical operational logistical are handled in an unacknowledged acknowledged manner, end quote. This means that no matter who it is, high-ranking official or otherwise, if one were to ask about such a program, one is authorized and required to deny its existence entirely. And what kind of operations would require such monumental secrecy? So if you go all the way back to Norbert Wiener, the goal of creating artificial intelligence was for them to become gods, to, to create an all-seeing eye. And the cybernetics group really, that basically dictated the, the, the direction for this uh, project was intertwined with the CIA. And what's interesting is out of the cybernetics group came two, two fundamental projects. So one was the creation of personal computer, and the other one was MK Ultra. Their goal is to create this global computer that sees all, sees everything, and where the humans evolved to create a collective mind, and according to Francis Hayline, because what Francis Hayline says that uh, you know, religions have failed us, most ideologies have failed us, and the, the world is in chaos, and we now need something to unite us. And he said that if we can create this artificial intelligence and this global mind, uh, then humanity will finally have something to worship. These Satanists have been pursued these subjects for exponential parts of time. Now. We have conducted in terms JFK of the probability that there will be a message from A in to B to in a given time period. We plot the net as a matrix with put ones where there is a link and zeros the where there is States. no direct link. entirely new paradigm, one which encompassed a holistic view of control that could potentially govern the world and the mind. The system they came up with required that individuals and society be placed in a common communications network. The eye of the beholder Amazing. sees a strange new technology.
all centered around man-computer symbiosis. Would you advocate a world ruled by scientists and by the super brains? No. We are fit for discovering how the world works. We're not fit for telling other people what to do. Written in 43, but couldn't be published until 1947 due to secrecy. They had a universal mechanism to create goal seeking behavior that made machines and even people basically programmable and showed how the communication of neurons could be modeled by a digital computer. The mind, in contradistinction to brain and behavior, emerged in the 1950s as a legitimate object of experimental research. The Neural Nets project of McCullough and Pitts spearheaded this cognitivist turn in the 1940s. Science of mind thus became a science of signals based on binary logic. Neural Nets bridged the gulf between body and mind, matter and form. The comparisons between the central nervous system as an electronic machine and the digital computer as an artificial brain boiled down to questions of logic, mathematics, and the very nature of reality itself. Many of the cybernetics members were now talking literally about constructing an artificial matrix. And a lockdown of unprecedented proportions. The first generation wireless 1G was voice. The second generation 2G allowed both talk and text. The third generation, 3G, the internet, in a limited way. And today's technology, 4G, completed that digital migration. But if anyone tells you that they know the details of what 5G is going to become, run the other way. The internet will be replaced by brain net. It is called the sentient world simulation. The program's aim, according to its creator, is to be a continuously running, continually updated mirror model of the entire planet, complete with billions of nodes representing every person on the Earth. This was a white paper put out by Purdue University in 2006, and the Sentient World Simulation, SWS, went live in 2007, which represents every person on the planet within this computer matrix as a node and every node is given an avatar an identifier and that is real time 24 7 monitoring of every person on the planet this is primarily but not exclusively facilitated by the adiabatic quantum computers produced by d-wave corporation there will be a virtual version of your brain as far as data is concerned of what molecules what chemicals and whatever make up the actual physical brain that data could be stored in the computer what i am principally is not this material stuff but a pattern of information well then if the pattern is the essence and if you copy the pattern to whatever level of precision you need then that copy that has the exact same pattern should be me at the time of initial reports on the program five years ago there were only 62 country level simulations being run by the u.s department of defense these simulations grouped humans into composites, with 100 individuals acting as a single node. But already at that time, the U.S. Army had used the systems to create a one-to-one -one level simulation of potential Army recruits. It's the stuff of a Hollywood movie, but a group of veterans has filed a lawsuit against the CIA and U.S. Army claiming that the government planted remote control devices in their brains. The claims relate to a government program at the U.S. Army's Edgewood Arsenal in Maryland. The the existence of these programs are acceleration of something discovered by Rogers, who uh, quit his position in the NSA on the basis of the faulty network advantages, at which point the entire purpose of signing with the Confederate KKK wizard contracts is nullified in its interest towards the United States, at which point it itself is a useless exchange of advancements, at which point the discovery of it being nonsense for the stated objective to the officials is actually an insurrection by itself, and 
serving no purpose to the United States, is only a Confederate act of treason by the KKK as malicious militia separatists uh, using its double agents in the government in order to uh, permanently disconnect checks and balances of the rule of law as to never be enforced. It needs to be understood that these insurrectionists are actively viewing the United States public as an enemy combatant, and they, regardless of whether or not the United States has a national security, are at war with the United States, and thus everyone loyal to the United States in the military, having sworn to destroy all enemies foreign and domestic, are immediately triggered to the current obligation to destroy them as an enemy of the country, and the restoration of all of the damages conducted against the United States must be investigated for its full restoration under the duel at which point the restoration of David's title creates the ability to generate the original intelligence oversight the Confederates were exponentially scared of as they had targeted and suppressed in an attempt to diminish the status of their superior as to not let the United States essential functions be understood in and of themselves as essential as they are, at which point you have the active illusion generating the destruction of the system uh, with the interest of creating contempt for essential national security features. In this landmass from coast to coast and everywhere in between, there lived hundreds if not thousands of different nations, tribes of people whose land this was. This was their home. But then others showed up to these shorelines in their boats. And that is when everything changed. In the spring of 1803, two American politicians visiting Paris closed the sweetest real estate deal they had ever seen. With the simple stroke of a pen, their country doubled in size, all for just $15 million. But in this deal, which was called the Louisiana Purchase, the U.S. didn't actually buy this land from France. France didn't actually own the land. What the United States was buying was the imperial rights to this huge swath of North America. This basically meant that France would stay out of the way and let the budding new empire, the United States, colonize it without interfering. If the United States really wanted ownership over this land, they would need to get it from the people who were here first, which at the time was lots of different native tribes. These are the people who had been here for thousands of years, way before Europeans had the idea of leaving their continent. And this land that the US just bought was theirs. Oh, and this isn't just me, like some modern enlightened person looking back and judging the United States at this time. The U.S. knew that this wasn't their land and that they were going to have to buy it from the people living there. And their big plan was to do things differently, not like the old imperial powers that they had just broken away from. In fact, George Washington was, quote, determined that the U.S. government's administration of Indian affairs shall be directed entirely by the great principles of justice and humanity. Go USA, let's do this in the right way. So instead of conquest, they would negotiate and sign formal treaties with these native nations. Then they would pay them for their land, fair and square. After all, this was a country whose founding document highlights justice, tranquility, welfare, and liberty. In our series, How the U.S. Stole, we get to see how the U.S. grew from a group of English settlers to a global superpower. But none of those stories would exist without this one. The origin story. The first thing that the U.S. ever stole. So Europeans are pouring into this newly formed country, the United States. And the government is making deals and signing treaties with the tribes, allowing these newcomer immigrants to settle on their land. At first, this is a fairly peaceful transactional process. The U.S. would offer food, farming equipment, cash, the services of a blacksmith, all in exchange for ownership over this land. But 
unsurprisingly, a lot of these tribes had no interest in moving out of their ancestral lands in exchange for, like, farming equipment. And this is where all of George Washington's ideals of justice and humanity really start to dissolve. The U.S. was becoming a more powerful nation. They needed more land for their booming population. So the impatient settlers and their government started playing dirty. The westward movement was like a great tidal wave. You start to see what happens when these tribes say no to the newly powerful United States. In one instance, one group of tribes up near the Great Lakes didn't want to sell their land. They told the United States that this river would be the border and to not cross it, to stay off their land. The U.S. said no, and they took them to war and lost twice. But on the third time, they won the battle and forced the tribes to sign a treaty giving away all of this land, basically all of present-day Ohio. Something very similar happened down here when these Seminole tribes refused to leave their land. The U.S. military came in, another war killing thousands, forcing the tribes to sign a treaty and pushing them into the swampy interior of the state where they had no access to their farmland or the ocean. Down here in what was becoming Alabama, the Muscogee Nation refused to sign a relocation treaty, but not wanting to go to war, agreed to sell a portion of their land in return for a guarantee that they could keep the rest. And the United States agreed, and they actually did. And the Muscogee kept their ancestral lands forever. Womp womp, no, that didn't happen. Four years later, a bunch of white settlers moved in, boxing the Muscogee out of their ancestral land. As tensions grew because of this violated agreement, the U.S. military was called in to force the Muscogee out of their lands. No treaty was ever signed. I mean, the shenanigans ranged the whole gamut here. They would get tribal leaders drunk to trick them into signing this paper that gave them all the land. They would appoint random people to be the tribal leaders and then tell them to sign away the land for the whole tribe. In another conflict, the Sioux and Arapaho nations defeated the U.S. military over and over until the U.S. finally signed a peace treaty acknowledging their land. And they were safe. Until gold was discovered eight years later, and the U.S. broke their treaty, redrew the boundaries, built roads on their land, and before you know it, you've got a bunch of white guys with gold pans harvesting this land. Treaties and justice be damned. control over this land that their government had stolen for them. And yes, you have all the paperwork, all the spreadsheets that they were making, all the treaties, a nice paper trail, but this was all a facade of justice, a thinly veiled campaign for imperial conquest. So we have all of this like fake treaty shenanigans going on to help the United States feel like they're doing justice. And it's working. They are moving loads of native people out of their ancestral lands so that white people can settle it. But there was one region that proved particularly difficult for this extermination project that was going down. Here in the Deep South, we had these five large nations that lived side by side with the settlers for a long time. They had all signed treaties with the United States that acknowledged their right to this land. Many of them spoke English, practiced farming, wore European clothes. Some even owned slaves. Because of this, these five tribes, the Cherokee, Chickasaw, Choctaw, Muscogee, and Seminole, were known as the Five Civilized Tribes. And there's an alternative world where these tribes could have remained on their land, living side by side with the Europeans as they settled. But that's not what happened. Mostly because of cotton. Farmers down here were getting super rich off of a very valuable cash crop called cotton that they could sell to textile mills around the world. It was an industry made even more profitable by its key input, free labor from stolen Africans. There was this one strip of land down here called the Black Belt Prairie that was particularly desirable for farming cotton. But as you can see, it was locked up in what the United States treaties had formally acknowledged as belonging to native nations. But the farmers down here were looking at this as like, this is a perfect place to expand our cotton kingdom. So these southern slave owners did what was kind of becoming U.S. policy towards the people living on the land that they wanted. They made up their own rules. The state of Georgia was particularly aggressive in trying to clear this land out, or in the words of their governor at the time, to replace, quote, all of the red with white population. They targeted the Cherokee Nation, passing a law that abolished their governments. The Cherokee are not going to stand for this, so they fight back using the same shenanigans that the United States is trying to use, the U.S. legal system. They take Georgia to court, a case that went all the way to the Supreme Court. And guess what? The Cherokee Nation won. Like, there was no way around the fact that they had ironclad rights to this land, signed and sealed. The highest court in the country just ruled that the states could not impose on tribal sovereignty. 
But, as we all learned in government class, a ruling from the judicial branch only works if the executive branch enforces it. Oh, and who was in charge of the executive branch? Oh, this guy. The guy who wrote a letter to his wife during the War of 1812 from the battlefield saying that he had successfully slaughtered 170 Native Americans in, quote, an elegant style. Oh, and the guy who's on our $20 bill. Yeah, him. Andrew Jackson thought that negotiating treaties with the people who were living here was a ridiculous notion. So he looks at the Supreme Court ruling that validates the Cherokees' right to their land, and he literally responds in the snarkiest way possible, saying, The Chief Justice John Marshall has, quote, made his decision, now let him enforce it. No, he was not going to enforce it. Jackson had a different plan in mind. It came in the form of a new law that he pushed through both houses of Congress. His whole worldview towards first Americans embodied in a piece of American legislation, the Indian Removal Act of 1830. It is important to understand that that is the purpose of David Bull's character in the position as top general of the intelligence oversight, the enforcement of the law for the checks and balances against insurrectionist, disloyal, degenerate traitors who would actively subvert their loyalty to their office, which is subordinated to the contract of checks and balances, and their insurrection must lead to their arrest and full correction as guilty, they must be fully punished in its entirety, as they are an act of threat to national security and cannot be considered otherwise. This became their dumping ground, and it came with a promise. Move here, and we will never mess with you again. And what's crazy to me is that even after all of the shenanigans, all the facades, they continued to play this charade, saying that the nation of Indians may choose to exchange their land where they now reside. The law says that the government had to negotiate these treaties fairly, voluntarily, peacefully, and that the government would, quote, forever secure and guarantee them their new land, and that they wouldn't break any of the pre-existing agreements that they had made in previous treaties. But no, this was just more pretending. A paper trail of pretend humanity. A paper trail of pretend humanity. Just as Andrew Jackson had ignored the Supreme Court ruling, he had no intention in following the law that he helped create. But he kept up the ruse. More documents, more signatures, more paper that made these civilized, justice-minded people feel like they weren't orchestrating a mass ethnic cleansing, sanctioned by the government, paid for by taxes, but they were. So this law is implemented, and the United States government, military, and even private companies start to ramp up their removal efforts of first Americans. They focus in on these five tribes that were sitting atop the land that they wanted for their cotton empire. More bribes, more pretend negotiations, and when push came to shove, more threats of violence. The Cherokee eventually signed a treaty agreeing to sell their last portion of land, and they moved west, out to their little rectangle of land that had been allocated to them by the government on maps. The only problem was that the leader who signed the treaty on behalf of the Cherokee people was not actually the real leader. They had no authority to make this decision. The Cherokee chief furiously protested this, but the U.S. didn't care. They had their signature from someone. In their eyes, all was justified. Between 1831 and 1838, nearly every member from the five tribes was expelled from their land. A hundred thousand people, whose home this was, now forced to walk by foot for more than a thousand miles through brutal weather and terrain, towards a little box on the map, a place they had never been before. The Cherokee would eventually call this journey the trail where we cried, or the trail of tears. Some tried to fight back against their oppressors, and others stood their ground until they were forcibly bound in chains by the U.S. government and herded west at gunpoint. Their land was vacant, and cotton farmers with their slaves moved in, and the economy grew. We'll never know how many people died during all of this, how many lives were really destroyed. Some people say 3,000, other estimates say 15,000, but you don't need those numbers to see how destructive this was. It was systematic, it was documented, and it was enshrined in law. We have a paper trail of all of it, showing the receipts, 
the payments, the treaties, the bureaucracy of it all. It's like a bunch of spreadsheets from the 1800s. American settlers, in an effort to be different from the old world empires they fled, ended up carrying out the first state-sponsored ethnic cleansing. There's a reason why Hitler, a hundred years later, references this exact event, this process, when he was carrying out his own ethnic cleansing. He said that the Volga, which is a river in Russia, would be, quote, our Mississippi. He said that Europe, not America, would be the land of unlimited possibilities. The engagement of the Confederacy as an insurgency has actively trifled against the United States in its rebellion against the rule of law, which has generated these systematic treasons. And the development has included their maturity, such as their overthrow of the rule of law at every single step that they could afford, as they are fundamentally anarchists who hate the concept of law, and being an enemy of law, have violently retaliated against it at every corner throughout history. At which point, the statement has to be understood that they cannot be united with a legal society. There is no capability to tolerate the union of both traitor and loyalist. At which point, the clan derived confederacy needs to be able to be arrested and fully punished according to the due diligence of these functions, generating the obligation of the military intelligence oversight of David's branch, which was frozen by these treasonous insurrectionists in order to obstruct justice at every systematic engagement, barring the ability of the United States government to enforce its laws against enemies to national security as they systematically destroy the United States, as they gain false allies who they intend to betray at a later date. They compromise them in these positions, generating the precedence of their future demise, at which point supporting them is an act of suicide by the incompetent, who not only do not understand history, do not have the capacity to basic fundamental competence, as they are a subhuman amount of intelligence generating society and their suicide pact being too stupid in order to live surmises itself to the position of being suicidal. So by the virtue of complying with the insurrectionist degenerates, you are in fact confessing to your incapable nature of existing in a free market state of nature. Now, the false claim of the laws of nature being whatever you could get away with is, in fact, fraudulent. The laws of nature is the assertion of the engagement of packs. And these engagements of packs of society, of your clan, of your tribe, of your etc., generates your ability to function as a collective organism. And the engagement of doing whatever you need to do in order to accomplish whatever you need to accomplish has to be conducted as a collective organism of the pack. And the engagement of subverting the stability of your company generates the, your position as a parasite infection. And the engagement of these parasitical infections generates the degrading of the total system, requiring, through their Ponzi scheme, uh, an obligation to expand the engagement of the pack, at which point they are eating and killing at the same time, at which point whenever you consume more than you take in, you are going to um, eventually kill the substance that has been feeding you, at which point you engage in the exponential period of the starvation as the inevitability of the rebellion against competent law Having the contempt of any construct of actual material morality as an objective enemy has at its core the obligation to pursue mere fraudulent morality, such as Jaysekul Civil War when the Confederates overthrew California and has sought the overthrow of the other states for the complete eradication of all republics. 
at which point you have the generation of these systems systematically being used against the American people by enemies of national security because there are no men in the United States military to protect national security. Having sworn an oath to defend and uphold the Constitution against all enemies, foreign and domestic, they have the immediate obligation to eradicate these fucking pieces of shit. Kill the insurrectionists is an immediate obligation by the United States military. The duty to arrest them and eradicate them is what they swore to do, and their refusal to do so is a confession to their effeminate nature of not accomplishing the quality of becoming a competent adult man. Their inability to become anything greater than a man-child, a baby who cannot become an adult by refusal of generating experience and competence in any organized society, has actively engaged in the assisting of the rebellion against their system which they have sworn loyalty to defend.